Saints of God must face the test, but you can stand above the rest. Take courage, friend, and walk on through. The Lord will face the fire with you. You can stand with the saints and say, My God will provide a way. God is able. God is able to deliver from the fire. He will rescue those who serve Him when the flames are burning high. Oh, 
Amen. As our children head off to their special time of worship this morning, and our choir goes down, I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the Old Testament book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 89 this morning. We sang perhaps the greatest, at least one of the greatest hymns ever written, in my opinion, How Great Thou Art This Morning. It is also the title to our message this morning, How Great Thou Art. We're going to be looking at Psalm 89, verses 1 and 2 this morning. If you're not real familiar with God's Word, if you open your Bible up right about the middle, you will probably open to the book of Psalms, find that 89th Psalm and verse number 1. And when you do find that place in your copy of God's Word, I would invite you out of reverence to God's word to bow your head with me this morning. I'd invite you to bow your head, and more importantly, I would invite you to bow your heart 
with me this morning. And take the next few moments of silent prayer time and ask God to speak to your heart this morning. Take a few moments of silent meditation. Then I'll lead us in a word of prayer and read our text. Father, as we quiet our hearts this morning, I pray that it is for one reason, and that is to hear from you. I pray that we'll be able to hear your word, not from my lips, but from the Holy Spirit. And I pray that we will listen with our spiritual ears this morning and know that Not a single one of us is in this place by chance today, but you've called us here because there's a message that you have for every one of us. So I pray your blessing on your word this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The 89th Psalm in verses 1 and 2, the Bible says that I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever, and thy faithfulness shall you establish in the very heavens. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. We sang this morning how great Thou art. And the question that I have for you and I this morning is how great do we really believe our God is? How big do we really believe God is? What do we really think about God? A few weeks ago, I gave a message and shared some children's concepts about God, and I'd like to share a couple more of them with you this morning so that you and I might recognize that in their thoughts about God, we might find our own selves this morning in determining in our own hearts and minds just who God is and how great he is. I'm reminded of one little boy who was praying before he went to bed one night, and he said, Dear Lord, thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. Now, that's a concept of God, I guess, in a children's life. One writes, God, who takes care of things when you're on vacation? I'm glad God doesn't go on vacation. I like this one. Lord, you don't need to worry about me. I look both ways before I cross the street. This is my favorite, though. Dear God, please send me a pony. I've never asked for anything else. You can look it up. (laughs) You know, it's amazing some of the things we ask God for. It's also amazing, the Bible tells us, there are many things we don't have because we don't ask. Well, let me give you just one more before we go on. This person writes, In school, I learned that Thomas Edison invented light. But in Sunday school... I learned that you invented light. Did he steal your idea? (laughs) Now, I don't know what your concept of God is this morning, whether it's broad or narrow. I don't know whether your God is big or your God is small. But I do know in my own life, I sometimes have the tendencies to limit God. I want to share three principles with you. I hope you'll write them down. I hope you'll jot them down. I hope you'll spend some time meditating on them during the course of this week. I want us to look this morning. His mercy is unmeasurable. His faithfulness is unfathomable. And his love is uncomprehensible. His mercy is unmeasurable. The psalmist tells us that I will sing of the mercy of the Lord forever. 
In the next verse, it says, his mercies are built up forever. It's interesting, as you look at the concept or term mercy in the Bible, it is found more in the book of Psalms than any other book in the Bible. You will find God's mercy mentioned more in Psalms than any place else in the Bible. I find that pretty appropriate since Psalms is often a book of thankfulness and a book of singing. And one of the things you and I are supposed to be thankful is for God's mercy. Perhaps the most known verse in God's word about mercy is found in the 23rd Psalm where it says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. In the 77th Psalm, you don't need to turn there, but you can jot it down. In the 77th Psalm, there's a series of rhetorical questions about God. Now, you know that rhetorical questions, if you come to our church long, are my favorite questions. I love rhetorical questions. They're not looking for an answer, but a rhetorical question elicits a response. What's my favorite rhetorical question, Waldo? Do you want a spanking? That's my favorite rhetorical question. Been so all my life. Do you want a spanking? Never once did I try my dad going, not today, Dad, I'll pass. He wasn't asking whether I wanted one. It was that simple rhetorical question. In Psalm 77, there's several rhetorical questions that are asked. One says, uh, is God's mercy gone? Not that it could be. It's a rhetorical question. Is God's mercy gone? Do God's promises fail? It's an obvious answer. No, his promises never do fail. The rhetorical question, has he forgotten his grace? I love the 108th Psalm. It tells us that God's mercy is so great it could reach the stars. Psalm 89 says it goes on forever. The 108th Psalm says God's mercy reaches the stars. In Ephesians, it says God is is rich in mercy. In 1 Peter, he says it my favorite way. Here's what you need to know about mercy, Peter says. He has enough mercy. That's the best thing. Because we can't comprehend how great God's mercy is. The psalmist tells us it goes on forever. Peter just says, here's what you need to know about God's mercy. He has enough of it. Now, I want you to think about mercy, because in the Old Testament, when they mentioned mercy, they would think immediately, the Jewish person would, of the mercy seat. It was the lid to the Ark of the Covenant. It stood in the very Holy of Holies room inside the tabernacle and later the temple. And once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into that Holy of Holies room and he would sprinkle a few drops of blood on that mercy seat. And that, those drops of blood, on that one day, once a year, those few drops of blood from a goat would cover the sins of the whole nation for a year. Think about that. Just a few drops of blood on that mercy seat would take care of the sins of the whole nation for a year. Wow. Y'all aren't just impressed, are you? All right, let me put it this way. If a few drops of blood from a goat can cover a nation's sins for a year, what do you think a few drops of blood from God's own son can do. Here's what you need to know. It is more than enough. His mercy is just unmeasurable. There's enough for you. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done in your life. There's enough mercy for you. There's enough mercy for every person in this building today. There's enough mercy 
for every person that's ever lived if they'll accept it. His mercy is unmeasurable. But the Bible also talks about his faithfulness there in those first two verses. His faithfulness is unfathomable. I love what he says there. His faithfulness is established in the heavens. Now that's unique because he uses that concept to try to give us some understanding of how to measure God's faithfulness. The book of Lamentation tells us, great is thy faithfulness. They're new every single morning. Every morning, there's plenty of God's faithfulness. I love that. But his faithfulness can be measured in the heavens. So if you wanted to build something that would house God's faithfulness, you would have to begin with a space the size of outer space. Really, you're not impressed, I see. Okay, You couldn't build a structure big enough. In, in that concept of understanding, this is great, in that concept of understanding, you'd have to build something so big, outer space, as far as it goes, couldn't contain. That's how big it'd have to be. All right, you're, you're still not getting it. Um, how many here ever watched the show Lost in Space when you were a kid? Yeah. How many remember that robot? What did the robot always say? Warning. Warning. I love that show Lost in Space. You know, I learned something from Lost in Space that I should have learned in, in uh, science class, but I didn't. Some of y'all here will be able to know from Lost in Space, or you bookworms will remember from astronomy. Our closest star, other than the sun, is what? Alpha Centauri. How many, how many remember that? Yeah, you should have learned. If you watched Lost in Space, you'd have learned. Our closest star, other than the sun, Alpha Centauri. Did you know that growing up, Lost in Space and even our astronomy class didn't tell us exactly right? We all grew up hearing Alpha Centauri is the closest star to us. Hmm. Well, actually, Alpha Centauri is not a star. It's not. It's actually a system of stars. Um, by the way, 4.3 million light years away. Yeah, some of you should say wow, because uh, you remember a light year, if you remember your science class. You'd have to go 4.2, 4.3 million light years, which means you'd have to travel at 183,000 miles per second. Yeah, that's just to the closest one other than the sun. Isn't that impressive? But here's what you need to know, okay, about Alpha Centauri. It's actually a system. Um, Alpha Centauri that Lost in Space was headed to, not really a star. It's actually two stars. They learned after we began to be able to look deeper into space that Alpha Centauri, what we thought was our closest star, 4.3 million miles away, was actually a pair of stars, a binary star that from us looks like it's one star, but it's really two stars that are really, really close together. And they're actually called Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. Y'all are catching on just like you should have in class when you were back there. It's actually two stars. Those two stars that make up Alpha Centauri are actually not the two closest ones to the Earth at 4.3 million miles away. There's actually one more in that little cluster of stars called Alpha Centauri, and I'm making a point with this, that is only 4.2 million light years away. Since it's a tiny bit closer than Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B, this one's called Proxima Centauri, meaning it's just a tiny bit closer than Alpha Centauri A or B. 4.2 million miles away. Not million miles, light years away. All right, which means if you traveled 186,000 miles per second, you'd get there in 4.2 billion years. Okay, you get the idea, it's, it's really big. Anybody here with me so far? That's our closest star. Now, remember, we're trying to build something that could house God's faithfulness. It is that big. That's our closest one. All right? That little binary star, Alpha Centauri A and B and Proxima Centauri, the closest ones we have to us are just two of the stars in our galaxy called the Milky Way galaxy. Um, I can tell you I would have never forgotten that when I was in, his, in science class if my teacher would have come in and passed out Milky Way bars in class that day and said, you need to know that the biggest, our galaxy we're in is called the Milky Way. I'd be like, yeah. 
I wish we lived in the Snickers galaxy. That's <laughs> what I'd be wishing, the Snickers. But remember, we are, our sun is a star in that galaxy. The closest ones to us, 4.3 million light years away, are two of the stars that are in a galaxy that has hundreds of billions of stars. Our galaxy. Hundreds of billions. And I hope you're beginning to grasp how big God's faithfulness is because our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is one galaxy of which we are an infinitesimal little tiny part of that galaxy that is one of hundreds of billions of galaxies. Okay, let me just put it this way. It's a little big for us to grasp. Um, let's just talk about our own sun. Because we see it every day, or most every day. Our sun is a star. We remember that from class, don't we? Our sun is actually one of the dwarf stars. Which means what? It ain't very big. Now, if you want to know how big our sun is, which is not a big star, know this. You could put 1.3 million Earths inside the star, the sun. 1.3 million Earths in the sun. And it's a dwarf star. It's a yellow dwarf star. There's other colors of dwarf stars. Hey, one day we get to heaven, guess what we're going to get to see? We're going to see all that stuff in a way we've never imagined it before. I can't, you know, the Bible says, eye has not seen nor ear heard all the things that God has for us. You think you've seen some pretty stars at night? You ain't seen nothing until you get to glory one day. And you get to see all them colors. This is going to be absolutely amazing. But you can put 1.3 million Earths inside our sun, and it's a dwarf star. <laughs> my favorite star, other than Alpha Centauri, and, well, I guess my favorite star is our sun, because we wouldn't do very well without it. Betelgeuse. How many ever heard of beetle geese? I don't call it beetle geese. What do I call it? Beetle juice. Yeah, it's just easier to remember beetle juice. Beetle geese is a big star. Remember, 1.3 million Earths inside our sun. Beetle geese, a bigger star, 1,000 times the radius of our own sun. Not 1,000 times the size. No, 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 no. You, you can't comprehend that. Just 1,000 times the radius, half the distance from its core to its outer thing, 1,000 times bigger than our sun. One little star. Then you got some cool, I wish I could have been in astronomy and named stars. I love this one, Canis Majoris. What does Canis mean? Come on, you Latin people, what does Canis mean? Dog. What does Majoris mean? Big. <laughs> Isn't that the coolest name star you ever did hear of? I don't call it Canis Majoris. I call it the big dog. <laughs> That's a big dog. We had the big dog. You know how cool big dog? When you think about that, but guess what? Big dog, 2,600 times the size of our sun. Okay, y'all still aren't really grasping. It's okay, but here's what you need to know. Okay? There's enough mercy for you. There is enough of God's faithfulness for you. You couldn't build anything big enough to house God's faithfulness. You can't think or comprehend how big God's faithfulness is, and that's okay, because I don't grab all them concepts either. I can get to 10, and if I take my shoes off, I can go higher than that. But I know that when I look out in space and realize and begin to understand the grasp of it, realize you could have to have all of that just to house God's faithfulness. There's enough for you. Then the last one is his love is uncomprehendable. Wow. <laughs> you see, mercy's great. God's faithfulness is great. And I struggle understanding God's mercy. I struggle understanding God's faithfulness. But I know all of them 
both mercy, grace, God's faithfulness, they all flow out of one thing, God's love, his love. It's uncomprehendable to me that God would love me with all of my sin, that God would love me. For me, it's the greatest thing I know about God, that God would love me. Every single person sitting in this room today, every one of us, has an innate, God-breathed-in, God-built-in desire to be loved. And no doubt you've experienced what love can be, and I know you've experienced what love, how bad it can hurt without it. But know this, God loves you. His mercy his faithfulness, his grace, there's more than enough of it for you. God's love, more than enough. How do I know God loves me? I know that God loves me because he proved his love to me. The greatest example of mercy in all of the Bibles, not a high priest on the Day of Atonement going into the Holy of Holies. The greatest example of mercy in the history of the world was God's son, Jesus Christ, on a cross, his blood spilt out for me, for you. How do I know God loves me? Because he proved and demonstrated it to me. His son, Christ, came and hung on a cross to die for me. See, the Bible says if you want to know God, if you want to experience God's mercy, you want to experience what heaven is like one day, it can only happen one way. Jesus himself said it. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father unless they come through me. It's not about going to church. It's not about being baptized. It's about what you do with God's son, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for you and me. See, all of God's mercy is great, but if it's not applied to my life, it means nothing. God's love is amazing, but unless I believe it and I accept it, it's nothing. And so the Bible says, if you'll come to God God's way, one, tell God you're sorry for your sin. Confess your sin to God. And two, trust his son Jesus Christ as the only way to heaven. If you're willing to do those two things, the Bible says that God will forgive your sin cleanse your heart he's got enough mercy to do it trust me <laughs> cleanse your heart forgive your sin adopt you as his child and you'll spend an eternity in heaven there's enough mercy there's enough of God's faithfulness but it's your choice it's up to you for me it was a decision I made at the age of 18 I said, God, forgive my sin, all of it. I'm sorry for it. And I trust your son, Jesus Christ, as the only way to heaven. And in that simple moment for me, happened to be in a church, but it could be any place you are. In that simple moment, God forgave my sin, cleansed my heart, adopted me as his child. I know God loves me because I know God proved it. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, if you don't know that's happened in your life, we'd love to talk to you about it before you go today. I know there's things going on after service today, but I can tell you there isn't anything more important going on after church today than for us to have a few minutes of your time to sit down and talk to you about that. Before we dismiss, we'll have an invitation, and we'll invite folks to come and pray at the front of our church. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, I'll be standing right here in the front. Just come and say, Pastor, I don't know, but I'd like to know. I've got another question. I want to settle it today, whatever it is. And we'll take a few minutes and sit down and talk to you about that before you go. Because we believe it's the greatest and most important decision you'll ever make in your life. God's mercy, unmeasurable. God's faithfulness, now the heavens and all of outer space can't contain it. But God's love proved and demonstrated 
and giving his son, Christ, to come and die on a cross for you and I. One of my favorite preachers I enjoy reading is Charles Spurgeon. One day Charles Spurgeon was out walking through the countryside with a farmer. Spurgeon, one of the greatest theologians there, there's ever been, and he's out walking through the countryside with a farmer, and Spurgeon looks up, and on top of a barn is a weather vane that says, God is love. Well, the deep theologian Spurgeon first comments, well, that seems to be a rather inappropriate place for that message. And the farmer said, you mean on top of a barn? And Spurgeon said, no. I just mean that a weather vane changes directions. And that's just inappropriate because God's love is always constant. And the farmer said, well, I guess you could look at that way, Spurgeon. But in my opinion, whatever way the wind blows, God is love. You see, that's what's awesome about God's word. It doesn't take a deep theologian to understand that God loves you. No matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, God loves you. What an awesome thing. God loves. The story is told of a boy whose family was on a boat. He got caught in a very bad storm. The waves were crashing. They were in a somewhat deserted part of the coast off of Maine. And their boat sank. His family all killed. Somehow the little boy was thrown by the ra waves up on some big rocks on the shore, and it was nighttime. And he stayed on top of that rock all during the night listening to the waves crash and the storm howl. And the next morning, there was a rescue boat. They found the little boy, saved him alive off of the, ro off the rock there on that coast. He was shivering and scared. Someone asked him that morning, were you scared? He said, yes. Did you tremble the whole time you were on top of that rock all night long? And he said, yes, I trembled all night. But thank goodness the rock didn't. <laughs> you know, the Bible says God is love. There's enough mercy for you. His faithfulness is so great you couldn't exhaust it. New every day. Every day. His love, unmeasurable. Uncomprehendable. He can be the rock. Even when the storms of life come around, he can be the rock. He doesn't shake, he doesn't tremble, he doesn't quiver. And it doesn't matter what you do. God loves you. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Heads bowed. We've shared this morning about God's mercy, God's faithfulness, and God's love. I wonder this morning if you're ready. Maybe it's time today to thank God simply for who he is. I, I know it can sound trite. And we talked in Sunday school this morning about the Jewish people thanking God in an incredible service. But maybe today you'd just like to come to an altar here at the front of the church and just say, God, I I'm not coming necessarily to say thank you for things in my life. But I just want to thank you for who you are. Can you imagine if you're a parent and your child just walks up to you and says, Dad, Mom, I don't need anything. I love you. Thank you for being my mom or dad. Maybe today you'd like to come to an altar and just say, God, thank you 
for who you are. Maybe you don't know for certain that the blood of Christ has atoned for your sins. We'd love to talk to you about it before you go today. Just come. Maybe today you just need to come to this altar and say, God, thank you for your faithfulness in my life. All through my life, you have been faithful, God. Thank you for that. Maybe there's something else you want to come and pray about today. Invitation is open. Father, I pray that you bless our invitation. May we be willing to be obedient in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed this morning. Heads bowed, our instrumentalist is playing, and our invitation is open. Maybe to come and say, God, thank you just for who you are. Maybe to say, God, I'm reminded of your faithfulness in my life. Thank you. Maybe to say, I need to know without a doubt that he's my heavenly father. Come on. Invitation's open.